That song is, is wonderful. Uh, that idea, though, that we are standing on holy ground. Do you believe that today? Do you believe that this, this room, these four walls, carpet and chairs, do you believe that this is a holy place? That this, <laughs> that the presence of God is here. That's what makes the place holy. Not what we do, not, not how we decorate, not even, not even how we worship makes a place holy. It's strictly the presence of God. And if you believe that the presence of God resides in this place, how you enter this place, and as Bonnie is saying, let us enter and praise Jesus now, as you enter this place or other places like this, it should change you. It should impact you. It should be different than when you walk into to Subway later today or Pizza Hut or Walmart. Amen. Uh, I hope your heart is different when you're in this place than when you're in somewhere else. Now, the beauty of Jesus on the cross and the Holy Spirit, to uh, continue on with that thought, is that the Holy Spirit has come back from heaven into our hearts. So no matter where we go, there is the presence of God. Amen? Do we believe that today as well? That while this place is holy because this is where God resides, Jesus, through the power of the Holy Spirit, resides in our own hearts if we have asked him to come and be in our hearts. And if that's the case, even when you walk into Walmart... There God is. Anybody walked into Walmart recently? It's tough. Tough to have Jesus, right? Uh, I put a picture out on Facebook yesterday that got uh, some funny laughs, but uh, um, Ellen, Ellen took me to task with that one when I said uh, it was a picture of, of an ape from the movie uh, Planet of the Apes and the dude, the monkey, the ch- orangutan, whatever he is, He's saying the word no in that movie like he just opens his mouth for the first time and he speaks and scares everybody half to death because a monkey just spoke, you know. And, uh, but the, the, the meme on, uh, for Facebook was uh, when you're in line at the cash, cash register and the person in front of you has paid, paid for their stuff and they're sitting there and talking to the cashier still. And you just want to go, right? And Ellen said that I needed to read about the fruit of the Spirit and patience and... Go, Ellen. Jeez. Whatever. God is good. Uh, all the time. And all the time. God is good. We uh, normally have been putting up the last couple months, I think, we've been putting the scripture that I read up on the, the, the projector um, because I know not everybody has a Bible. Um, and if that is true, if you don't have a Bible, would you talk to me and so I can get you a Bible? Um, but not everybody brings their Bible to church. <clears throat> Uh, in fact, uh, funny story, it's a good thing I'm a pastor that has an office full of Bibles because I had to go to my old Bible because I didn't bring my Bible today. So uh, I can get away with that, though, because it's right there. Um, but I'm not putting them up on purpose because what we're going to talk about today um, is a tough subject. Uh, Monica alluded to it. We're going to talk about stewardship. And, and every time a pastor says, okay, we are going to now talk about stewardship, everyone goes, oh, he's going to talk about money. Oh, he's going to talk about tithing. Oh, he's going to talk about money again. And I'm here to tell you today that stewardship is so much more than money. Stewardship is so much more than tithing. Stewardship, the definition of it, is taking what you have been given and doing well with it. Right? So that's the overall idea of stewardship. We have, on our church board, we have a, a, head, of, a head steward in the church of the Nazarene, we call him. Because he takes, or she takes, everything that comes into the church and does well with it. Okay? So whether that's resources, whether that's gifts through money, whether that's through facilities and how we manage things, no matter what it is, whatever God has given you, the idea of spiritual, the spiritual discipline of stewardship in your own life, is what you do with what God has given to you. Now, what we're going to talk about today is how do we give back to God and how do we give our best 
to God. I said it earlier, we sing the song, I Surrender All, right? That's one of my all-time favorites. Anybody else like that song, I Surrender All? Um, All to him I freely give, right? I owe it to him because of what he did on the cross. And because of what he did on the cross, I surrender it. I give it back to him. And we live our lives differently than that. Um, I was talking with, with some people before, before the service, uh, and I said, I'm probably going to offend some people today. Um, and so I'll apologize ahead of time. My wife's probably shaking her head right now and cringing uh, because uh, my email is rachel.montas at geonetric.com. Just kidding, sweetheart. I don't want to, don't send her any hate me email for me, okay? Uh, but <laughs> did anybody win the lottery? Okay. Uh, $1.3 billion, I think, is the new, uh, the new amount on that, right? That's insane. That's insane. So, so that means that, that the Iowa lottery, or the, 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 it's a national thing, right? So I, the lottery people are going to be able to award somebody $1.3 billion of profit, okay? They got to pay their employees. They got to pay all kinds of overhead for their cost of doing business, right? They're not in it just to give away all the money. So, so more than $1.3 billion has been spent towards this total, okay? Now, I'm not here to tell you, and I, and I want you to know this is coming from a, a man who has had an addiction to gambling, okay? I've been very upfront about that. I have done that in my life. Uh, the Powerball is not something I ever, I ever did. I always thought that was kind of silly, um, but... I'm willing to bet that across ch- churches all across this country are people sitting in congregations who have given more money to try to win the lottery than they've given to church. Okay? Why don't you just think about that? And I'm not, I, if you have the money to give to, the, to, to try to win the lottery, if you've, if you've got all your debts paid, you're, you don't have anything that you've got to worry about financial-wise, I don't think it's the best choice. Uh, I don't, but there's, there's nothing in the Bible that I can point to that says that's a sin. So I'm not saying that at all. What I'm talking about today is giving God our best. And when we have given more money to try to win something that is one in 292 million is the odds on that today. Okay. One in 292 million. You may think you're one in a million. I saw this on Facebook the other day. You're not even one in 292 million. Okay, that's the odds of winning the lottery, and yet we have people that have given hundreds to thousands of dollars to try to be that one in 292. Well, somebody's got to win, right? Might as well be me. Dear God, please give me the opportunity to win the lottery so I can prove that money won't change me. You seen that, right, on Facebook? That's one of my favorite ones. Um, A little kid praying by his bed. Dear God, please bless me with the lottery so I can prove that money won't change me. Um, We give God the leftovers. We give God the leftovers of our life. And and I'm, I'm here to tell you today that God's not pleased with that. Okay? We think that we serve a God and this is probably because of the way we were raised. Um, I'll be honest with you. I was, uh, I've been in church all my life. Some of you have been in the church all your life. Um, I, I grew up, I was in, my, in the youth group. My youth group life was in the, uh, like the um, early 90s through 2000. Um, when I graduated high school in 1999. So that was my, my time in youth group. And during that time, churches were changing. They were trying to really be um, uh, uh, grabbers of, of people's attention and they were trying to, to do these big grand things to draw a crowd and youth groups were no different. They were, they'd hire a big youth, a, you know, big name youth pastor and they'd come in and they'd start their own worship band and do good things like that and they'd play games, you know, instead of teaching the word of God um, and they, cause they want to draw a crowd and they want to say, and so they get time to worship and sometimes you'd get there and I mean, this is my youth group experience cause I went to a, 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 a medium sized church, but they would try to get us to sing right on, on our youth group time. And, uh, I spent some time recently with our youth group and it's still the same today. Uh, try to get them to sing 
And they just, dun, 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 dun. And they're, not, they're not opening their mouths. They're not letting anything come out. They're just, and, they, and you get a youth pastor, the guy that's in there, the girl that's in there trying to, trying to encourage these guys to go. And they're saying, come on, guys, you can do it. Come on, just sing a couple songs. Just, just sing a little bit. And they, they won't do it. And you say, how about, how about guys versus girls? We'll make a competition. Who can sing louder, right? We'll, we'll do anything. We'll play, we'll play basketball after this if you'll just sing. And we have this mentality, and I, I'm t- I grew up this way. We have this mentality where if we just, and then the, the kids will do it, start to do it, right? And, 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 the, and, the, and the pastors will be saying, good job, guys, good job, you, d- you did good. And we, 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 we have this mentality that God operates the same way, that he's begging for us to participate, that he's begging for us to just sing a few songs, that he's begging for us to give just a little bit. That he is happy with those leftovers. You know, there are, the, the latest statistic is that of all the people that go to church, um, and, and, and every church would agree that if they agree to, that the tithe is required for a follower of Jesus Christ, that 10% is the number. However, Across all of churches, uh, the average church member gives less than 2% of their income to church. That's crazy. That's crazy. Every, everything in the Bible, and we're going to get to, we're not, not going to get this today, but we're going to get this, we're going to teach on tithing. Everything in the Bible says 10%. Tithe, the word tithe means 10%, Okay. We're going to get to that in a few weeks. Um, we're, going to, we're going to spend a week. Today's just kind of an overview of stewardship and giving back to God. In a few weeks, um, we're going to touch on time, a week on talent, and a week on treasure. Okay? And I believe that God is not pleased with what we give to him. 2 Timothy chapter 4. Again, I'm not going to put these passages up there because I want you to turn with me to these passages. And I want you to see for yourself that this is in the Bible. Okay, some of the pews, some of the chairs have, have Bibles under them. Uh, if, you need, if you want to look over someone's shoulder, uh, you know, just tap them on the shoulder and say, hey, I got to look. Um, share if you need to. But I want you to know that these verses come from the Bible. So I'm going to start with 2 Timothy chapter 4. This is a verse that doesn't necessarily have to do with stewardship, but it has to do with the fact that people will seek out the place that tells them what they want to hear. Okay? We have so many different churches, so many different types of theology, so many different denominations, that I promise you, if you are offended by what I say ever, you can go less than a mile away, two miles away from this location, you can find a place that probably will tell you what you want to hear and make you feel comfortable about the way you live your life. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3, Paul writes here to Timothy, for the time will come... When a man will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. Okay? I believe we are living in a time where men seek out and women seek out something to make them feel good. Their their ears itch with what they want to hear to make them feel better about themselves and the choices they've made and the way that they want to live their lives. Yes, ma'am? 2 Timothy 4.3. Sorry. Yep, 2 Timothy 4.3 is that where that one's from. Guys, ladies, gentlemen, teenagers, children, this is so important that you have to know your Bible. You cannot take what I tell you and say, oh, that must be true. Pastor RJ said so. Because then you can go down the road to hear another pastor who believes very differently than I do and say, oh, that must be true, pastor so-and-so said so. Well, who's right? This book is right. And you've got to interpret this for yourself at times. Now, I will present to you what I believe. I'll present to you what I believe God has told me this passage means. And you can trust my interpretation only so far And you have to then choose for yourself what you believe. And if you disagree with me and your first thought is to go somewhere that you can hear something that does agree with you, you're doing a disservice to yourself. 
Because God is not pleased with men and women who seek to have their ears tickled to make themselves happy with their lives. Amos 5.21. Who's read Amos recently? Anybody? You read Amos recently? Oh, man. That's pretty good. Amos 5.21. Amos was a prophet in the Old Testament. Uh, it's kind of it's kind of right. It's after Daniel. It's right in the middle. Well, kind of. But it's a tough one. You may have to look at the table of contents for this one. But I'll let you get there. Amos 5.21. And this is harsh. Try not to read ahead. If you get there, don't look at it until I read it. Because it's in your face. God, this is God. Amos is talking, saying this is what God says. Amos 5.21. It says, I hate... This is the words of God. I hate, I despise your religious feasts. I cannot stand your assemblies. Even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, I have no regard for them. Away with the noise of your songs, I will not listen to the music of your harps. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never-failing stream. Why did God say that to the prophet? Well, they had been, and we're going to look at some passages just a little bit farther in Malachi here in just a second. But they have been told, these Israelites have been told from the beginning, the Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. The Messiah is coming. He hadn't come yet. So their religious things began to look like what we dub good routine. They had become, they showed up at the right time, they sang the songs, they gave the sacrifices, and they went home to lunch, to Subway, to Pizza Hut, whatever. They came, they fulfilled their duty, and they went home. And God was not pleased with that. God was not pleased. He hated, he despised what they were doing. And that is a tough, tough thing to look at. If we look at that verse there that says, uh, verse uh, 22, even though you bring me burnt offerings and grain offerings, even though you may give to the church, you do what I've asked, you've given to the church, I will not accept them. Though you bring choice fellowship offerings, you love each other. We love each other. I will have no regard for those offerings. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Just because we come to church does not mean God is happy. Just because we give our money doesn't mean God is happy. It comes down to a heart issue. Are you truly seeking out to give God your all? Or are you just trying to do the bare minimum of the law? Because that's what the 10% was. Now, there was tithing before the law, and I can't wait to teach this because a lot of people say that once the Mosaic law was done and broken by Jesus coming back, it disregards everything else. Not always true, okay? There was tithing before the Mosaic law, okay? And we're going to look at that. And if there was tithing before, and Jesus talked about tithing, and Paul references tithing in the New Testament after Jesus is dead and buried, I guarantee you, I'm here to tell you, God still institutes a tithe, okay? Now, What we want to look at here with this, good things are happening, right? The sacrifice is coming in. The the offerings are coming in. The fellowship is good. The music is happening. Worship is happening. Turn to Revelation chapter 2. You guys are going to get annoyed with me. But that's okay. Revelation chapter 2. John was uh, spoken to by an angel, and he he writes these letters to these seven churches. And he writes to the church in Ephesus, uh, verse 2, chapter 2, verse 2 of Revelation. I know your deeds, your hard work, and your perseverance. Good things. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked men, praise the Lord, that you have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them false. Yeah! Yeah! You have persevered and have endured hardships for my name and have not grown weary. Good stuff. What's the next word? Yet. Mm. 
Yet I hold this against you. You have forsaken your first love. Remember the height from which you have fallen. Repeat and do the things you did at first. If you do not, sorry, repent and do the things you did at first. If you do not repent, I will come to you and remove your lampstand from its place. But you have this in your favor. You hate the practices of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. Okay? God saw good things happening. The church is doing good. Guys, we're doing good. As a church, we're doing really good. Good things are happening. Kids are coming to know Jesus Christ. Adults are giving their lives or even renewing their lives, refreshing their commitment to God in this church, in this place. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. However, if we allow ourselves to get like this church in Ephesus, where we're just a machine that's working through everything, and we're not remembering our first love, which is Jesus Christ on that cross, we're missing the point. We're missing the point. How many churches that run thousands and thousands of people? One, one church in particular that I, I, I paid attention to uh, out in Seattle. 15,000 people in their church through seven or eight different campuses that they had. Pastor goes under fire for some things, resigns, walks away. Less than four months later, 15,000 people have to find new churches because they were just a machine that just continued to do what they did and they weren't in love with Jesus Christ on the cross. And they just, they, they had to walk away. They couldn't, they, there was nothing left because one man left. That's insane. And if that's the type of church that we have, we're in trouble. Malachi chapter 1. This is the main scripture for today. Malachi chapter 1. Most of you, if you've done any kind of studying of the Bible, uh, may know Malachi as the, the chapter, the book of the Bible that pastors talk about when they talk about tithing. I'm going to use it today to talk about giving God our best. Because it's what God says. This is why I want you to read this out of your own Bible. I don't want to just put it up on a screen and you say, oh, RJ must have. That's what RJ says. No, this is what God says. Matthew, or Malachi chapter 1, verse 6 is where we're going to start. We're going to read through the rest of the chapter. A son honors his father and a servant his master. If I am a father, where is the honor due me? If I am a master, where is the respect due me? Says the Lord Almighty. God is already questioning the Israelites' respect of him as their father and master. It is you, O priests, who show contempt for my name. Now he's talking to me. But you ask, how have we shown contempt for your name? You place defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have we defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible. Verse 8. Important stuff here. I want you to really look at how this applies to your life. When you bring blind animals for sacrifice... Is that not wrong? When you sacrifice crippled or diseased animals, is that not wrong? Try offering them to your governor. Would he be pleased with you? Would he accept you, says the Lord Almighty? Now implore God to be gracious to us with such offerings from your hands. Will he accept you, says the Lord Almighty. And here's the big one. Verse 10. Oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would not light useless fires on my altar. I am not pleased with you, says the Lord Almighty, and I will accept no offering from your hands. My name will be great among the nations, from the rising to the setting of the sun. In every place, incense and pure offerings will be brought to my name, because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord Almighty. But you profane it by saying of the Lord's table, it is defiled. And of its food, it is contemptible. And you say, what a burden. And you sniff at it contemptuously, says the Lord Almighty. When you bring injured, crippled, or diseased animals and offer them as sacrifices, should I accept them from your hands, says the Lord. Cursed is the cheat who has an acceptable male in his flock, vows to give it, but then sacrifices a blemished animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord Almighty, and my name is to be feared among the nations. I think most of you, all of you, understand what that's getting at. 
we bring our leftovers to God. As a church, I have to speak against that. I cannot say that less than your best is good enough. Churches all across the country are saying that. Churches all across the country are saying, just give what you can. Just do what you can. And they're hoping that, that you'll do that and that you'll grow in grace and mercy and in your disciplines and in your following of God and you'll grow to give your best. But they never call you to it. And this is, this is where I, 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 if I offend you, I'm sorry. But it is so important that you give your best to God. That you do not give anything less than everything. All of your life. It is what he has called us to do. It is what we say we do when we say, God, I give you my all. I give you everything. I, I give you my life. Right? We sing the songs that say, I, I give you my heart. I give you my life. I give you my all. And then we do what we want. Okay? I think it's a, a funny picture there where, where, where the prophet Malachi is speaking and, and he's telling these priests, you bring these, these diseased animals, you know, and, and they say, you, what, you've got, got this field full of great animals over here, great sheep, whatever animals they got. Pick, you pick whatever you want and you need to bring and give them to sacrifice to God. Pick a good one. And they say, well, we got this one over here and he runs around and hits his head on trees and stuff. Why don't we just, why don't we just give that, that one to God, right? This, this one over here, he's, he's, he's only got three legs, right? He got in a fight. We had to cut one off. He's still alive. Let's throw him on the altar. That's, that's what's happening here, right? That, that's what he's speaking against here. And, and we do that, Okay? We do that with our life. We do that with our giving. We do that with our time and our talent. And our tra- all three areas of that, we do that. God has called us to give all of our time to him. Does that mean we spend 24-7 in the church? No. But it means something, that we give our entire life, the time in our life to God. God has blessed each and every one of us, each and every one of you with talents and gifts, and he has called you to give those back to him. In many ways. The gifts that you enjoy in this life, the intelligence, the, 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 the musical abilities, the, 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 the people skills that you have, all the things that you enjoy in this world are not just for your enjoyment, for your benefit. They are to be used to advance the kingdom of God. And you'll get enjoyment out of it, I promise. Every time I get to sing songs to God and praise and lead worship, man, that is so much fun. And I enjoy what I do. But if I were to just be singing just for my own benefit, I'm missing the mark. And I'm not giving my best to God. And God would not be pleased. Our treasure, I know it's a big one. I know it's, it's a point that a lot of people don't like to talk about. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you what the Bible says. I'll tell you what God says. Because the, the reality with the treasure thing, and with the time and talent for that as well. What you give back to God is an indicator of what's going on inside your heart. Okay, What, what you are willing to give to God, what you're not willing to give to God and is, is an indicator of what's inside your heart. So as a pastor, as I look at what's going on in your guys' lives and how you guys are responding to what the Word of God says to do in those areas, it, 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 it's an indicator to me of where you're at spiritually. And while a lot of people don't like to talk about it, a lot of people don't like to say, well, I'm I'm struggling in this area, I'm struggling in that area. As Paul writes in later, the acts of the flesh are obvious. The acts of the sinful nature are obvious. And this is one area where that obviousness comes out. Because when we don't give our time, talent, and treasure 100% of it to God, it's obvious. And there's there's a disconnect somewhere there there's something that's not happening in your relationship with God that needs to change. And that's the important part of that 
that thing. Malachi chapter 2, I'm almost done, I promise. This is why it's so important. And in verse 10 where it says, oh, that one of you would shut the temple doors. If we become a church that does not give everything to God, he would rather us just lock that door and walk away. And he has this admonition for the priests of that time. And this is, this is to me. And I want you to know why it's so important to me to lead you the way I'm supposed to. Now this is an admonition is for you, O priest, if you do not listen and if you do not set your heart to honor my name, says the Lord Almighty, I will send a curse upon you and I will curse your blessings. I have already cursed them because you have not set your heart to honor me. Because of you, I will rebuke your descendants. I will spread on your faces the offal from festival sacrifices and you will be carried off with it. Some of you may have more modern speak than that uh, in your Bibles where it says, I will uh, rebuke your descendants. It says, I will curse your offspring. I just had a son, right? So this hits close, close to me right now. I will spread on your faces the offal from your festival sacrifices. They sacrificed animals. I'll leave it up to your imagination what you think the word offal means. It's not good. God, God himself is saying that he wants to spread that stuff on the faces of priests who do not honor him with how they give back to God. <laughs> That's, so I take this, so I'm going to take this pretty seriously, okay? Because I don't want that to happen to me. But I also want God's name to be proclaimed and for him to get the glory. I don't do anything out of fear. I take it as a warning, and I say, I'm going to give everything I've got to the one who first gave to me. And my call to you today is for you to do the same. As we look over the next four weeks of time, talent, and treasure, I want to call on you to say to yourself, be honest with yourself, God, what do you want from me? And the answer is he wants it all, but here's the awesome thing is each person is unique. Each one of us has a different set of skills. Each one of us has a different ability. Each one of us has different uh, emotions and ways to deal with things. And so it's going to look different for each person, and that is awesome because then when we bring all of that together, right, when we bring everything that we have to give into this storehouse, into this local church, when we bring that together, and I've got this, and you've got this, and someone else has this, and someone else does it this way, and we bring that all together, it works because that was God's plan from the beginning. But if, if one person just brings this and the other person who, who would fulfill this other part of this thing only gives a little bit or nothing at all and expects someone else to pick up the slack, it doesn't work. We are all called to bring everything we've got to the table to set it on the altar of sacrifice and say, God, here it is, I give it to you. Do what you will. And when we do that, I promise you, that he is going to take that, bless it. We're going to look at verses that come. He says 30, 60, 100 times over. He is going to bless that. Are you willing to trust him? Are you willing to take that step into the sea? If we read the, the story of the Israelites crossing over the, sea of, uh, the, the Red Sea, those priests, they had to step into the water first. You ever heard that old gospel song, Step Into the Water? Wait out a little bit deeper. You've got to get down into the water, and then the waters departed. When those priests who were carrying the ark across, they stepped their foot in, and then the water started moving. Okay? They didn't stand on the side saying, he said he'd move the sea at this time. God, what are you doing? I'm waiting. Still waiting, God. You got to take that step. You got to step out in faith. And when you do, the waters depart. And you see the blessings of God. Takes that step of faith first. Are you ready to take it? In 2016, are you ready to take that leap of faith that we're talking about? All year long, we're going to talk about taking a leap of faith. And we've got to start with our own spiritual disciplines. We've got to start with talent, time, and treasure. God is good. God is faithful. And he will bless what you give back to him. I promise. We're going to have testimonies 
over the next few weeks from people. I've talked to several people already that we're going to have some testimonies and they're going to share what God has done in their lives when they've been faithful with their talent, time, and treasure and how God has been faithful back to them. I would encourage you to be here every single week. Let God work in your heart and show you how you can be better and more pleasing to him because it glorifies him and I promise you it makes your life better. God's not going to call you to do something that he can't bring you through. Amen. Let's stand together. Close with a word of prayer. Thank you for letting me uh, take a journey through the Bible a little bit. We're going to do more of that over the next few weeks. Uh, and it's going to be good. God has a plan. It involves every single one of us coming together. And Grace Point Church of the Nazarene in Davis County will explode for God if we do this, if we buy into this. Heavenly Father, oh God, we love you, we praise your name, we give you the glory, Heavenly Father, and Lord God, I pray that, that we would be a church that you look down upon and say, that is a church that is preparing people to be the bride of Christ. That is a church that is preparing people to be disciples that can stand on their own two feet and say, I don't need the baby food anymore. I can take the spiritual chunks of meat and say, this is what I'm going to do with my life, and I'm going to go do it. Lord God, I don't want to be a church that, is, that you look down on and say, just, just shut the doors. Just lock it up. Get rid of it. Because you're not pleased with what we do. Lord God, so I pray that we would give everything we have for you and for your glory. In your name we pray. Amen. Have a great day, everybody. Remember, no, no meeting here tonight. Get together with somebody.